Um, last time I, I, I kind of gave you a pretty uh, decent, I think, yeah, arguably, <laughs> overview of chapter 11. And I'm um, going to go back, pick up a few things that I have improved uh, in there, and um, show you those. So, um, so I'm about to post these notes. This is my lecture. What is it? Lecture 21 is not posted yet, but it will be. And one of the things I would point out to you is I basically have the arguments we went through last week written out in here for the most part. And a few extra ones. I think my thinking's a little bit more clear here, a little bit more logical than what we did in class even. For the most part, um, not universally the case. But uh, I think it's okay. I hope to have a video posted from last week sometime soon. I haven't got that yet. Um, but one of the things I would point out to you in this is on page 10. Oh, not page 10. I showed you this. Uh, we did this. But what we didn't do is work out <clears throat> to find it. We didn't work out what's boxed in blue there, which is that the ideal uh, generated by 2 plus the ideal generated by uh, 1 plus the square root of minus 5 is actually just integer multiple integer linear combinations of 2 and 1 plus the square root of minus 5. In other words, what's in blue shows that, in fact, this sum of these two ideals is a lattice. All right, with integral basis 2 and in 1 plus the square root of minus 5. Now, that's a more problem. So. Which one? This whole page. Oh, that's up for you guys to figure out. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do your homework for you. I'm not going to tell you what <laughs> it is. Come on. I just need how nice you were today. Um, yeah, it's like a carried away. So anyway, page, page 11 of section 11.5. There's a, uh, I mean, odds are it's an 11.5 problem. But, uh, <laughs> you're trying to trick us. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I just, I also wrote this page out about, you know, he says that that principal ideal has the same shape as z joins squared minus 5. So I just, I, I wanted to kind of like look at what that meant. So if you look at multiples of alpha, beta, for a fixed, um, for a fixed beta, what you're doing is you're taking this grid, right, and you're multiplying by this complex number. What's that do? It stretches it out by this factor, right, and it rotates by an angle beta. So if you think about what that does, it just gives you another rotating, rectangular grid tilted, and that's why it has the same shape, right? Because it's still a rectangular grid; it's just on the side. So that's why. <coughs> that, that that's one of the comments I wanted to expand on there. Of course, we already seen that it's not the same shape as two plus this two plus one plus two. The ideal two plus the ideal one plus generated by one plus square minus five. Not the same shape, right? Because it's kind of this tilted thing, right? It's not just a rotation of a rectangle, a right angle rectangular grid. It's a, it's a more parallelogram thing. Anyway, so here's some more comments um, concerning the uh, the lattice. I want to show you the proof here briefly. Um, so basically, section 11.6 says, hey, if you're looking at imaginary quadratic fields, in other words, Q would join the square root of D, where D is square free and D is negative, then any ideal in there is, is a lattice. In other words, it is either built from one generator or two. That's it. Um, well, actually, that's, that's a little bit stronger than that. Not just that, I mean, <clears throat> we say that let me be more precise. So these are these these, these lattice, the, the ideals in these these in Q, uh, ideals you find inside Q join the square root of D, they have to be generated either by one thing or by two things in the integers of Q adjoining square root of D. And more than that, those actually work back out to be lattices as we've already seen in the example I worked out explicitly last class and also in the one that I just showed you the homework problem. You can always kind of regroup terms so you eventually just get integer linear multiplication and integer linear combinations of at most two things. Um, well, I guess it's always two things if it's the lattice. But. Um, <clears throat> so we say the lattice has an integral basis 
alpha beta if you can form the whole lattice from integer linear combinations of alpha and beta. That's not I mean, integral basis. It's very sneaky terminology, right? And here's the proof, basically. When d is less than zero, a non-square ideal in the integers of q to the d is a lattice. So what you have, if you have a non-zero ideal, right, you can take an element alpha which is as close to zero as possible. All right. Since it's an ideal, minus alpha and alpha times the square root of d are also in there because it's closed under multiplication by, you know, uh, by the integers. In the, in the quadratic field, in which those integers always include minus one and square root of d. So, <clears throat> and on the other hand, if you look at that, the angle between alpha and alpha square this is this is basically i times the square root of a you know a rational number. In the complex plane, these guys are perpendicular, right? One is in, in the alpha direction; the other one's like rotated 90 degrees that way. So they're they're you know the right angle, and so it, it stands the reason that these are not collinear, right? So if you think about building uh, combinations of those, integer combinations of those, you're going to fill out some sort of lattice. They're not collinear, you're definitely going to lattice from alpha to alpha square root of d. So that shows that if you just pick the smallest element, use the ideal property, you automatically get two things in there, you definitely get a lattice. The question is, is that all there is, right? Um, so suppose there was something else, all right? So suppose there was something else. Um, so suppose you had beta, right? If you had beta in i, it's close to zero, um, not in the direction of the alpha. Um, oh, I'm sorry. This isn't quite the thing. And this is uh, rather than using this, rather than using alpha square root of d, he uses beta, which is. I mean, beta might be. Um, how to say this? It could be there's something closer than alpha square root of d, I guess. So you be careful about that. And you just choose beta to be something else that's as close to zero as possible, but not in the direction of z alpha. I suppose it's possible that beta could be alpha square root of d, but it's not necessary. I mean, it, it's, it could be that, but it might not be. Anyway, the point is, pick two things as close to zero as possible, right? And build this ideal, which is the integer linear combinations of those two things. So then you get this, like, Parallelogram, which has is built from alpha and beta, and if you think about there being something else in there, say gamma, it's got to be in one of the four one of the four sub sub parallelograms, right? But when you look at this, you can pick the nearest corner, which is which is built from the integral basis. I mean, it's, it's alpha n m plus beta n, and you look at the distance from this to this, what you get is that that's less than um, the maximum of alpha and beta, uh, which is which is to say what? That contradicts the construction of alpha and beta, so there can be no such point, which means that this smallest alpha and smallest beta generates the ideal as a lattice. So this proof not only gives you an indication of the fact that any ideal inside the quadratic, uh, you know, an extension of the rationals by an imaginary <coughs> square root, the rational i times the rational square root of square root. Q adjoins square root of d where d is square free, d is negative. It shows that any ideal has to have this form uh, of a lattice. And more than that, you can build the lattice from just finding the two things which are closest to zero, right, but not collinear. So it kind of gives us a, a method to construct it as well. So that was. <coughs> Excuse me. I didn't want to write that out because I'll burn 40 minutes of class writing that out. And I think once the dust settles, you should realize I've given you this argument before. It's the same thing we did, constructing the division algorithm. Like the argument is stupidly close to those arguments. I mean, it's, it's almost that again. Um, we actually have a theorem here. The and and so if I if I had if I had done that argument more carefully in the style of Stowell, he actually is careful to only give arguments that use addition and subtraction. You don't actually need the ideal property to prove what was on the previous page, right? But if you also have the ideal property, you can prove, in addition, that the ideal is actually equal to um, the principal ideal generated by alpha plus the principal ideal generated by beta. Which is what we saw last class in the specific example, and it is also the homework problem I presented to you. It's that ideal plus that ideal is an integer linear combination of them, right? 
So what this is saying is that's not a that's not a quirk of those examples. That's kind of a generic feature inside these imaginary quadratic fields. So the argument goes like this: if if you have this as an ideal, it's simple to see that that's a subset of this plus that, right? Because how do you define these? These are just um, you know combinations of alpha and beta, where you take what you take coefficients in the uh, integers over the quadratic field, but the integers of the quadratic field include the irregular integers, so you can just find this and that in there. So that, that's, that's the easy direction. Um, <clears throat> conversely, conversely, if, if, if i is an ideal, then if alpha is an element of i, it follows that the ideal generated by alpha is an i. And likewise for beta, thus i contains Alpha and beta, but that means that this is equal to that. <coughs> now, am I wrong again? I see you look of confusion. Not a good sign. <laughs> but, um, so let me see here. Let's scroll back up a bit. Yeah, so we're defining the, um, let's see here, I'm defining, I'm defining i to be alpha n plus beta n, so to be the uh, integral linear combinations of alpha and beta. Um, and I'm saying that i is an ideal. So if you assume both of those things, it forces i to be equal to alpha plus beta. I mean, Ideal generated by alpha plus ideal generated by beta. All right, now that I've got that out of my system, let's move on to the next one. I will put, post this, you guys. What? Pretty good. All right, so um, last time we defined the product of ideals, right? And um, one of the things I should actually prove for you, right? is that the product of, so this is, if A and B are ideals, the product ideal was defined to be like linear combination of products for both of them. More often than not, guys, the arguments I notice, it basically boils down to they just take this, and it's just, it's just A and B, like a lot of the arguments are just based on taking a single sum. So you should include in your concept of product of ideals just products of single pairs. You know, that's definitely a lot of what goes on in the arguments. But having that linear combination there is important for certain things. So, but I think the first theorem we should prove is that the product ideal is an ideal. I don't think I did that last time. I don't think it's in Stilwell. But it's simple enough to do. It's notationally a little cumbersome. So, we, we, do, we always do, right? How do you prove something's ideal? Pick two things in it, right? Z and W and the product ideal. And then I need to show what? I need to show that Z plus W is in the ideal again. Right? And I need to show that r times z is again in the ideal for an arbitrary r in the, in the, in the larger ring. So the critical thing here is to understand what, the, what defines the ideal, right? So the definition of this product ideal is you can, you can build things in the product from, from, from sums of multiples, one from a, one from b, right? So particular, in particular, that means that z can be written like this, and w can be written like that. Now, I guess technically speaking, I can't really assume they have the same degree, let's say, like the k could be different on the z and the w. But if you think about it, you can make it the same y, because you could just pick whichever one's larger in the non-trivial sense and just add zeros to the other one, right? So like, if, if, the, if you pick a z which goes out to like 10 terms, and you pick a w which only has five terms, OK, so just add five zeros to the w so that they match and just pick the maximal degree to characterize both of them. That way you can add things that have the same type. Otherwise, notationally, it's a real uh, That's my first thought, okay? We can make them look the same, the elements. Despite the fact that k is allowed to vary, we don't have to have the same k for all things in the product. We can always choose the maximal, uh, maximal k for both elements in order to make the addition more natural. That's my first thought. 
So once I've done that, z plus w is easy to add, just add them. And then look, you've got a sum of things. A sum of, you, you again, you have a sum of products, things from A, things from B. Now you've got 2K of them, but we don't care. We're allowed any number of sums of things, right? It's still the product. That's actually why you need the linear combination definition to start with, so this happens. So you're allowed that, right? If you were, but anyway. <coughs> so there you go, that's an AB. And then, of course, you just have to argue that Z times, R times Z is in the, in the product, right? But that is also easy because <coughs> RA1, RA2, RAK, well, those are all in A again because A is an ideal. So I could just call that A1 prime, A2 prime, AK prime, but look at what you got. You got a sum of things, sum of products A from B, A from B, A from B. So by definition, that's in the product ideal. Consequently, we have proved that the product of ideals is, in fact, an ideal, which is important. This ideal, right, is going to take the place of the idea of number. So we would like that a product of our two new, new numbers is, again, a new number, right? And this is part of that story. Now, <clears throat> at this point, I'm going to put it away, though, and I'm going to start writing. I just these, these are things I wanted to go through fast and not draw out longer than they needed to be, because And 
ideal P is prime if P contains a B implies B contains A or P contains B. Now we, we weren't able to make this definition before, right? Because only now, only before before section 11.7, we didn't have a definition of product of ideals. See, that's a new, a new thing. All right. Well, that's the definition of prime ideal. Prime ideal is an ideal such that if you have a product ideal inside it, either the product can you know, it has to be a product of either. Uh, Basically, the things making up the product either have to be prime, one of them has to be prime, excuse me, words. One of the divisors basically has to be the prime ideal itself, right? Now. Well, quote unquote divisors. Okay, so <clears throat> if you look at this at the level of elements, it's easy to see what exists at, at elements. If you think about this phrase here, instead of thinking about sets, think about elements. What do we have? We have if um, see here, you choose the right letter in the notation. We have a b and an element of a b that implies what? Notice these are containments. I'm, I'm flipping them around. Fine. I can afford a little bit more. I need this is a b. Subset of P implies A is a subset of P, or B is a subset of, of P, right? So in, in, in terms of in terms of elements, that means that A B, which is you know, well, is A B an arbitrary thing in, in big A B? No, but it is something that's in A B, right? So a particular a particular. Um, consequence of the line above is that if AB is in AB, that implies that either A is in P or B is in P. Okay, so that brings us to a theorem. I don't know. I think maybe that's actually a theorem about proof. <clears throat> this is equivalent definitions for the prime ideal. So the following are equivalent. Do you know? 
something. Very, very suspicious. <laughs> default, <laughs> default reaction to questions. It's, it's very, hmm. What does this person do? Because you're broken. You so, broke you broke let's, this morning. Let's suppose A, B, suppose one, okay? So suppose A, B, a subset of B implies that A is a subset of B, or B is a subset of B, all right? Start there. And then we're trying to prove two, all right? So let, let A, B be an element of P, all right? Now that, since P is an ideal, implies that multiples of A, B, right, are a subset of P. No surprise there, as, as P is an ideal. Products of A, B are once more in B. But we can also notice, and I, I think that I have trouble following so well here because, well, I'm not as well versed in these things as some people, I suppose. But we can look at this. So if you took, if you take the multiples of A times the multiples of B, form that product ideal, what's that look like, right? What's this look like? This is by definition what it's. It's A one B one. Plus da 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 plus a k b k such that what? Well, such that a j we I mean, such that you know a j is an element of this, and let's say b sub j is an element of that. But what is you know what is that? What do those what do those actually look like? What are what are multiples of? <clears throat> you know, just to do an entirely unnecessary amount of writing, da 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 plus ak, ak. So what is this really? This is something like aj is alpha j times a, right? And bj is beta j times b for what? For some alpha j, beta j in the ring, right? So if you put these back in here, what you really have is what? You've got, you see you've got an A and a B on each one of these. So you can factor out alpha one, beta one, alpha K, beta K, and outside you get AB, right? Where again is alpha one, da, 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 alpha K, beta one, da, da, beta K, just bring elements, forming multiples to the that one. But hey, what's that? It's the ideal generated by a Right. So. That's what? Ah. So returning to what I'm about to underline in green, <clears throat> this guy right here, right? Now we know that is the same as that. So therefore, what? Therefore, a, b is a subset of p. But what? By assumption, thinking of this as the a, thinking of that as the ideal b, right? We know those are ideals. We proved that previously, <clears throat> or I believe you guys could prove it. That implies what? That implies that either A is a subset of P or the ideal generated by B is a subset of P. Right? But certainly A and B are multiples of A and B. Right? So the element A and the element B are inside those principal ideals. So that then implies that A is an element of P or B is an element of P, which is what we set out to prove. <coughs> Right. You guys get it? I hope so. But if you didn't, I'm about to do more of it, so hang in there.
So the other direction, Bailu. <laughs> I was watching the video from like last week. I've been right over here for like five minutes before you finally panned over. What the? Uh, what was I reading there? I didn't have to know. I don't know. Okay, so assume one. Assume I'm not going to write it out again, but let's assume two. Wait. And suppose the product A B is a subset of P, and um, let's suppose that A does not contain P, or excuse me, A is not a, what? Yeah, A is not a subset of P. In other words, P does not contain A. So what do we do for some angels? Subset summary R, right? We seek to show what? Yeah, B is a subset of B. Now, <clears throat> so notice that since A is not a subset of P, what's that imply? That there exists, there exists some A in A for which A is not an element of P, right? I mean, that's what it means for it not to be subset. There has to be some point in A which is not in B. Then nothing with controversial error. So if you think about it, um, A, B, a subset of P implies what? Implies that A, B is an, L, is a, rather, an element of P for what? For all, one. Well, A is definitely an A, and this B we could let be anything in in the ideal generator in the ideal B, right? For all B, so B and big B. That's a, that's just definition of the product ideal. Right, certainly, one point there in our P once more. If A B is a subset of B, thus, you know. As A, A, B is an element of P, right? Remember what, what if we were assuming what? We're assuming two here. And two says that if A, B is an element of P, then A is an element of P, or B is an element of P, right? So A, B, and element of P implies A is an element of P, or B is an element of P, by assumption of two. However, uh, what? Right. A is not an element of P, therefore B is an element of P. What's that say? But B was arbitrary, right? Therefore B is a what? A subset of P, which is what we set out to show. <clears throat> now, as we go on, as you look at arguments from here on out in chapter 12, the sometimes they'll use characterization 1, sometimes they use characterization 2. There's a proof in chapter 12 where he uses both characterizations in the same proof. So, how do you want to define a prime ideal? You can use either one or two. We'll take as the definitions how we go forward. And again, one is convenient for some places, one is convenient for other places. Now, let us then make a definition. Now, I think the next thing to define is a maximal ideal. What's a maximal ideal? Basically, it's an ideal which is as big as it can possibly be, and not be what? Well, that's not quite very big. Um, so 
So an ideal is maximal if when you find a larger ideal, right, if you found a larger ideal than that ideal, in other words, an ideal which contains this given proposed maximal ideal, then that larger ideal, that containing ideal, it's one of two things. What is it? It's either the whole ring or it's the ideal in question. So, write it down. Definition an ideal M is maximal if um, J containing M an ideal Tommy, sorry, language, grammar, if an ideal J subset of J implies J is equal to what? The whole ring? Right? Oh, over the ideal. Right, or yeah, it's all yeah, I mean, this is all the universe. <laughs> the universe is our, I mean, I'm talking about ideals inside some commutative ring with identity. Well, we might want to give up the identity at some point, I don't know. All right, so <clears throat> that is a maximal, or maximal ideal. Um, so, let's see here. For example, integers are usually easy to think about, right? See, so what are the ideals? What are the ideals in the integers? We already know, right? Well, I just, they're what? Like ideals generated from like one number. Right, right. So let's see here. Is um, we could look at three, for example. We could look at uh, let's see here four. Now four, I can definitely contain in something, right? This is what? This is a subset of what? Two. Yeah. Which is, so, four is not, not a maximal ideal. In fact, you can show that four is equal to two times two, right? And neither of the things in that product are four itself, right? So four is, this ideal generated by four is not a prime ideal. And apparently it's not maximal either, right? Three on the other hand, is there any other thing except for this that you could I mean, by the way, that doesn't count. That's the same set. Yeah. So anything prime in the integers just means it's maximal. Hmm. So like, always the case then. It looks yeah, it looks like an ideal generated from a prime is maximal in the integers. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, there's if if you know if if this is contained, if this is I mean this is contained in one. But that, that's exactly the integers, right? So if something, if another ideal contains that, it's either the ideal generated by three or it's the whole integers again, right? Now there's something in general we can say. Zero. Every maximal ideal, every maximal ideal is prime. And, and when I say prime, I should say it's a prime ideal, just to be clear, all right? We're talking about ideals. All right, so here's proof. So let's suppose 
M, a subset of some ring R, is maximal. Obviously, a maximal ideal. Let um, let's see here. Let's let A B be an element of M, and let's A let's A let's let A not be an element. All right. We seek to prove what? What do we seek to show here? B is an element. Right. So what we're going to do is a standard trick. We're going to um, we want to use the maximality of M, right? means we want to find some ideal, right, which is which is larger than M, and it is based on using this point outside M, right? So how do you construct a new ideal built that, that has M as a subset, right, that contains M, but is also like, like larger than M based on this point A? This is, so I would, this notation, I like this notation, you basically like say you take M and extend by A. So this is like consistent with our z adjoint square minus three notation, and so here's but here's the definition of this. <coughs> definition: you just take a times r, right, and you add m times s, such that what r and s are just ring elements, and little m is an element of m. So definitely that contains m. Certainly it is an ideal, right? Well, anyway, if you don't believe me, you can, you can show that this is an ideal. That's not, that's not totally difficult. Can you guys think of how to write that in terms of notation we already have? So I think this this is generically something like this, right? And this is essentially just a generic element of M. Yeah, I think that this is really just A plus M, yeah. But a little bit, it's, it's kind of, but it's got this S here, which kind of make, gives me a bit of pause, but I'll put a little question mark here. Um, it's a very little, very little question mark, though. I'm pretty sure about this. Um, anyway, whether or not that's that, for sure, definitely an ideal. And so what do you have? You have an ideal. Which is what? It contains M, right? It's not equal to M, because it's got this point, it definitely got this point A in it, which is not in M. And if M is maximal, what does that force this to be? Right. A maximality of M, we have MA is equal to R. But R is a ring with identity, right? So therefore, 1 is an element of MA. Which is awesome, because that means that there exists R and S, and an element R such that what? 1 is equal to AR plus MS. But then we do what we always do. We multiply by B. And then we think about our life. Let's see here. What do we know? What's that? It would be B A plus B. Yeah, this, this B 
da plus what? bn. Since we said ms is m. Well, ms is an element of m. Right. Yeah. Uh, is it an element? I mean, element up here. These are both element of comments. Sorry. Right. Um, the da is also an element of m. Right. So ba is an element of m, which b and bar is an element of m because m is an ideal. So this is an element of m. Why is BMS an element of that? Right, exactly. So this is really just M times DS, right? But DS is a ring element, so M times a ring element is again an M. So the sum is an M as well. And you know what? That was what we were trying to prove, was that B was an element of M. So as you can see, we just use characterization two of the prime ideal. We used elements in this argument. But this shows that every maximal ideal is prime. The converse is not true. It's not always the case that a prime ideal is maximal. But I think an example of that would be the non-principal ideal in z equals square root minus five, right? So <clears throat> let's think about that for a second here. So we had in z joins square root minus five, we found what? Two plus what was it? One plus square root minus five. Was that the one we studied? I think it was. That was the one that had the triangular shape. Is that right? Yeah. Now, oh wait a minute, that is maximal then, that is prime. The only ideal bigger than that is just Z adjoining square root of minus five itself. So that's actually an example of a maximal ideal. Therefore it's prime. That's not the example I want. Players. Well, we will rest assured that there is an example of a, a big prime ideal which is not maximal. So let's put that on our to-do list of things to notice. <laughs> oh well. Let's see here. Um, so. He has a comment here about, you can think about <clears throat> another, in addition to that example that I raised, which is fine, but uh, another example you could look at would be the ideal of J, which is 3 um, plus 1 plus square root of minus 5. You could, through arguments much like we made last class, show that this is ba basically integral combinations of 3 and um, one plus the square root of minus five. Your M and N are integers, ordinary garden variety integers. And you can argue that this is maximal. How would you argue that's maximal? So what, what else is there? What else is there in, in, the, in, the, in the universe, so to speak? The ring is the adjoined the square root of minus five. What, what else? What other kinds of points are in that that grid that are not in J? So what, what other kind of points do you have to contend with? There are really two kinds. There's things like m prime plus 1 plus 1 plus the square root of minus 5 n j prime. Or you have stuff like 3m m prime plus 2 plus 1 plus the square root of minus 5 n prime. These are the other two types of points. Because when you look at integer multiples, you know, um, 
this, what is, what is this, remember what this is, this is what, this is a plus b squared of minus 5, right? Don't ever forget that, that's the base of everything we're thinking. So if a is an integer, integers are what? They're either multiples of 3, well they're either in 3z, they're in 3z plus 1, or they're in 3z plus 2, those, those, those three classes of numbers partition the integers, right? That's all you got. So the multiples of 3 are in j, these are the other two options. So if, if elements of this type, if elements of the first type, we call this type 1, we call this type 2. So if elements of type 1 are in this, in this larger, you know, points outside j, so you know, let's let k be the hypothetical ideal which contains j, right? So this would say if 1 is an element of k, well, k over. I mean, if, that, if, if these kinds of things are in k, that means that 1 in particular, because you can choose m prime equal to 0 and m prime equal to 0, then that gives you 1 as an element of k. But if 1 is an element of k, then k is equal to the whole ring. Right? Because 1 generates the ring. Of course, I could write z if n squared minus 5, but r is easier to write. <coughs> what happens in this one? So if these guys are elements of k, that implies that 2 and 3 are in k. See, because you can, you can choose m prime prime equals to 1, or excuse me, you can choose m prime prime equal to 0, and where they put? Let me try this. m prime prime equal to 1. Oh, how about 6 and 5? Two and five, right? That's easy enough to see. Two comes from m prime prime equal to zero. Five comes from m prime prime equal to one. But if two and five are in it, then five minus two is, means that you know five minus two equals to three is an element of k. The ideals are closed under subtraction, which I will eventually prove. I never did quite prove that. <coughs> I have a proof for you. Hey, but that means that 3 minus 2, which is equal to 1, is an element of k. Ah, game over. K is already here. So, any ideal which contains j, <coughs> by process of elimination of all the different possible cases, of which there are only two, generically, thinking about 3, they're all the ring. So this ring is maximal. Now, there's another, another maximal ideal in z adjoins the square root of minus 5, which is interesting, the so-called conjugate ideal. But do you think the conjugate ideal to j is? j bar would be my notation. I don't think he really uses that notation much, but if you look at 3 plus 1 minus the square root of minus 5, this would be the conjugate ideal. Then you can prove that that's maximal for much the same reasons. And that means what? These are both maximal ideals, therefore they are? Prime. That's right. Now, at this point, I'm going to get back out the projector here. Do you guys, well, let me catch up on me. <coughs> so I was a little shaky on what prime was versus what maximum was last time. I hope now they're starting to be clear, right? They're clear in my thinking. I think my belief is, is faith-based at the moment, though. 
Um, <laughs> let's see here. So, Chase Powers is dead. Chase Powers is dead. I tried to use that on a group one time too. Yeah. Was it Dr. Kester used to say? Salvation is by faith, but your grave is by works. He's a Calvinist, I think. Um, an ideal B divides A if, if there exists an ideal C such that A is equal to BC. Now we can, we can make that definition how we have product. Right? Although we don't really use this language much, but you could if you wanted to. Um, and so this is another definition. The ideal generated, generated by both A and B is that is the sum of the principal ideal generated by alpha plus the principal ideal generated by beta. And so I showed you some of these calculations last time. I just want to go back through them again briefly. Um, for example, claim two factors as two comma one plus squared minus five squared. So basically the argument simply just goes like finding things which are in this ideal, like four is in there, two plus two squared minus five is in there, minus four plus two squared minus five is in there. It's easy to argue these things. And then when you add this, this, and this, you get two. Therefore, two is an element of that, which shows you that the ideal generated by two is a subset, right? And then you can you can turn the argument back around and, and get that um, <coughs> it's also true that this uh, two is a subset of that, and this is a subset of two. Therefore, they're equal. Anyway, these arguments are actually pretty simple. I think you can read them and understand them. I um, I have worked out the proof here. This is what pretty much what's installed. Uh, this part to me makes perfect sense. It's you know I don't know. I'll let you guys read this. We already went over it last time. I'm just telling you, I've written out the details here too. Um, but they're not especially exciting. They make good test questions. I do think that. Um, the, I think, I'm not sure if I assigned it an exercise or not, but whether or not I've assigned this as an exercise, this would be like a good thing to prove as like a warm up for test three. You'd like to be able to prove those. Those would be, i put those on my list of things to make sure I understood. I don't think they're that hard. And the proof is modeled on the thing I just showed you, which basically boils down to finding things um, in the, you know, in the ideal generated by two things, which build you the one thing. So it's usually some kind of just silly arithmetic. But we can talk more about those later. We can move along here. Oh, so that's about it for that. Mostly I wanted to show you that I put some notes out concerning that material. So that brings us to chapter 12 properly. Chapter 12 is on ideals. So what we want to do in chapter 12 really is to treat ideals properly. We've been looking at examples of ideals in chapter 11, right? But we haven't proved everything. I mean, we proved some general things today. We did that also, right? Uh, maximal implies prime, for example. Right, we proved that. Um, but, uh, Chapter 12, we're going to look at ideals a little bit more seriously. Let me, so let me, let me just put this away. I think I need to put it away. Well, oh, this is what I wanted to show you. No, I'll put this away. So here's like a little lemma that I wanted to share with you. If, if I, a subset of R, is an ideal, right? and x and y are in i, then x minus y is in i, minus x is in i, and 0 is in i. Now, I have been asserting these things for some weeks now, right? But I think if you go back in time, I don't believe I actually proved that subtraction. I made some claim. I don't think I really proved it. Here's proof. So 
If you have one is in the ring, that means one times x is x, right? But minus one also has to be in the ring because you know that minus one plus one plus minus one has to be zero, right? So there's this thing called minus one, which is the additive inverse of one, right? But you also know by distributivity that one minus one, right, which is one plus minus one to be more precise, is equal to this, right? Um, however, you also know that this is equal to zero, which means that you know that this works out to zero, so that means that this is equal to zero. But you, on the other hand, know that x plus minus x is zero. So then you have this equation. You have, um, where is it? x plus minus x plus minus x is equal to x plus minus 1 times x. Notice that conceptually these could be different things. I'm working merely with the ring axioms. But this little argument proves for you that in a ring with identity, in fact, minus 1 times x has to be equal to the additive inverse of x. I just asserted that in a previous class. I never really proved it for you. This is the proof. That was sneaky. So anyway, once you have that, then it's kind of easy. Because then, for example, um, if you have minus 1 times x is equal to minus x, well, if, if, if we're in an ideal, if x is in the ideal, then anything times x has to be, again, in the ideal. So minus x has to be in the ideal. So there's minus x in the ideal. But once you know minus x is in the ideal, it's easy to prove why minus x is in the ideal, because y plus minus x is, after all, again, a sum of things in the ideal, which is, again, in the ideal. But if you search your heart, you'll realize that I, I cheated you before. I just asserted this was true. I bullied you into, into, into trusting me. I don't think I gave a complete proof of it before. Here's the complete proof. So there you go. That's what I pushed under the rug earlier. And with that, I'm going to um, go back to writing. Define 
A is congruent to D, mod I, is what?
So what should be proved then? Do you guys have class right after anybody? Uh, wait, what class? All right. Well, next time, next time I will prove that we can define arithmetic on these congruence classes in the same way we defined modular arithmetic earlier. In fact, the proofs I will give you for the arbitrary ideal will, subs will, 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 will subsume. I mean, excuse me, they will include. They will contain the case of modular arithmetic as a particular application. So in some sense, I didn't need to prove for you those things were modular arithmetic earlier this semester because we could just get the proof now and go, hey, apply it. But it's, it's not bad. We'll get some proofs. In fact, you'll recognize these proofs as being essentially the same, except for I is playing the role that NC played before. Anyway, chapter 12 is very beautiful. The last hard thing I think that we covered really was that, that theorem I got confused about. And, and Daniel talked to me about it one day, and like everything I was confused about was just stupid, um, mostly. So anyway, at some point I will, I will post an apology video. So you don't see a proof that I, I'm not there yet, but uh, it really wasn't. We were pretty close to being like, but anyway. Something else I'll get to here. Anyway, have fun, take your tests, live your life. Can I ask a question?